Welcome back to Grade 7 History, Unit Number 1, New France and British North America, 1713 to 1800. This is Lesson Number 4, Why Was the Fur Trade Significant and What Caused Tensions to Rise? Before we begin today's lesson, let's consider the following. Can a business be historically significant? For example, do you think that Apple or Microsoft will be important to our world's history? Put the video on pause so that you can consider this question and jot down your ideas in response to this question, and we'll talk about it at the start of our next class. All right, let's proceed. In the early 1700s, the British and the French were extending their power in Europe by developing colonies in North America. The strategy of taking over other countries or lands was known as imperialism. And take note of this image here. This was the royal standard of King Louis XIV, the French king who decreed or decided that New France was a royal colony. New France did not grow as quickly as the British colonies. It was harder to grow crops in New France due to the harsher climate and short growing season. This led the Canadiens to enter the fur trade. The French government sponsored, that means paid for, expeditions to find more First Nations trading partners because the fur trade was quickly becoming the main part of the economy of New France. And this illustration depicts a First Nations tribe guiding the explorer La Salle through what is now India. Just a reminder that New France included much more than what is now Quebec. It also included parts of what are now the modern United States. For more than 200 years, the French and the First Nations developed trade relationships that helped both groups. The French realized that the First Nations had a much larger population, so it made sense to form good business relations with the native peoples. For example, they took part in gift-giving ceremonies during negotiations to show their respect. Friendly relationships developed between the French and First Nations also helped the French in times of war. The First Nations became military allies. That means partners who agreed to support one another in case of war. As well, French Catholic missionaries tried hard to convert as many First Nations peoples to Christianity. These religious ties also strengthened the fur trade relationship. Just looking at this image, there are plenty of historical paintings similar to this one. What we're seeing is the Jesuits, or black robes as they were called by the First Nations, who were sent to New France to teach Catholicism to the native peoples. They were not always welcomed by the First Nations, who were actually quite correct in their suspicion that the Jesuits were part of a larger plan to assimilate the native peoples. In the early 1700s, the French received almost all of their furs from Montreal. Their native traders brought furs from what the Canadian called Le Pays en Haut, the upper country, a vast area north and west of the Great Lakes. The Treaty of Utrecht gave this land to the British, however, and so the French had to set up trading posts in other areas to keep on trading. Competition in the fur trade was so fierce, it led to the British and the French competing for more trade with the First Nations. The British tried to take much of the fur trading business with the Wendat, Delaware, and Shawnee First Nations from the French. In turn, the French tried to capture the business of the Cree. The First Nations were aware of this competition and they used it to their advantage. Many First Nations trappers would travel to both British and French trading posts, see who had the better prices, and trade with whichever side gave the best prices or the finest goods for their furs. The fur trade did bring serious negative consequences. 
Over time, trapping led to the beaver becoming nearly extinct. Fur traders brought and spread diseases such as smallpox, which killed tens of thousands of First Nations peoples. First Nations women's, women sorry, played a vital role in the fur trade. Native women prepared the furs, which included skinning, cleaning, and tanning the hides. After learning English or French, Native women acted as interpreters, advisors, and guides. Some First Nations women even played a role in making deals between different peoples. One such group was Tana Delta, a young Diné woman who in 1713 was captured by the Cree. After being released, she traveled to the Hudson's Bay Post, where she helped bring fur trade business to the HBC. She was also influential in negotiating peace between the Cree and the Dene, and she's considered so important in fur trading in First Nations history that this iconic painting uh, shows her working to bring peace between the fur traders, the Cree, and the Dene people. Between 1713 and 1755, the populations of New France and the British colonies grew. The need for more land for settlers led to increased conflicts among the French and British settlers and the First Nations. British settlers started moving westward, starting farms on First Nations territory near the Ohio River, as well as areas in which the French had set up fur trade posts. And here you can see on this map, the Ohio River Valley is the area colored in blue. The British simply did not care that France had claimed the land years earlier. To expand the fur trade and maintain contact with their First Nations partners, the French set up forts that would act as both trading posts and military strongholds. Some of these forts were built on lands that were claimed by Britain. And as you can see from this map, the Spanish were also busy setting up forts to protect their land in North America. Important to keep it in mind that this time, it was certainly the British and the French who were competing for North America, but they both had to contend with the Spanish who did not want either the French or the British to forget that they also had interests in North America. In 1713, the French built a massive fortress. Fortress Louisbourg was built to serve as a center for French fisheries, a major a major trading port and the largest military base in North America. The fortress was built in what is now Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia. The French believed the Louisbourg would be a safe place for French ships to dock, but when war broke out again in 1744, the British captured the fortress. While they would return Louisbourg to the French in 1748, they decided to build their own fort in nearby Halifax. And this is not a colorized picture. This is a more recent picture of Fortress Louis Burke. It has been entirely reconstructed and is now a museum and tourist site. And in future lessons, we'll learn about what happened to this fortress and why it had to be entirely rebuilt. European forts gave the First Nations peoples more choices in terms of buying and trading goods. However, most of these forts were built on native lands without consent from the First Nations. The First Nations preferred to trade with the French since they only traded for furs, unlike the British who took native land for farming. Still, the First Nations found themselves trapped between two European powers that were becoming increasingly hostile. Economic tensions also grew. The British strategy was to hurt the French economically rather than militarily. By capturing Fortress Louisbourg, the British were able to cut off the supply of French goods to other forts for three years. And it is said that after the British seized Fort Louisbourg, some First Nations peoples actually attacked French forts and took whatever goods might be left. 
Tensions continued to rise in the Ohio River Valley. This area was a valuable transportation route, and the British saw the area as a perfect place to make new settlements, even though the French had already set up forts there. The Ohio Company was formed by British settlers in Virginia to start creating these new settlements. This brought tensions between the French and the British to a boiling point. So we're ending on a cliffhanger, folks, and in our next two to three lessons we're going to see what exactly happened as the tensions reached a point where the british and the french were no longer interested in just exchanging words with one another uh, but for now this map shows where the ohio company was creating british settlements all right so to wrap up i'm leaving you a couple of discussion questions questions which you are going to write down your responses to very soon. The first question is, what makes the fur trade historically significant today? Um, in other words, why are we taking time to study a fur trade which took place over 300 years ago? And then question two, which do you believe was the main cause of rising tensions between the French and the British? Was it overlapping land claims? Um, construction of forts, or competition for the Ohio River Valley. So what you're going to do is you're going to put the video on pause so you can take a look at these questions again and write down your responses because we will talk about this in our next class. If you don't feel ready to answer these questions, it means you need to go back, watch the video at least another couple of times, and then when you're ready, put the video on pause. All right, I look forward to hearing your responses to these questions in our next class. But until then, this concludes today's video.